Psalm 63 says, Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I will look to you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. One, two, three, and... Jesus. 
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin.
Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for the worship. Thank you all so much for the worship. It is just so awesome to, uh, to be, be here this morning in church. It's a different day. Definitely a different day in which we live. It's different for us. I don't know that it's very different for God. He sits in such a position that he does not fret, agonize, or, or wring his hands. I can't imagine to sit in a position like that. That's our desire in our lives, isn't it? To be in a place where we have everything under control. That, I mean, our, our lives are in such a place uh, that our homes are secure, our bank accounts are secure, our health is secure. We think that that is the epitome of life, is for us to have all those things together. And honestly, I do believe that that's something that God has ingrained in us. But we focus so much on having that now. And we forget the fact that this is a battlefield. And what we desire so much to have is what we will have when we get home. And that this is not our home. And I believe it's in a time like this that God has really rattled us to where he has stripped away so many things from us that we're now second-guessing a lot of things. It seems like he's taken every, nearly every idol that we have and called it into check. I mean, I could go through the whole list of idols. I won't do it. I think in our own minds we've probably uh, went through that list a while, but... Uh, over the last couple days and over the last week and a half. But today, I, wanna, I want us to be challenged in our minds about this battle that we're in, this, this war that is waged on this earth and this battle that we're in. And in this battle, I believe there are marching orders. It's amazing that March the 25th is the National uh, Medal of Honor Day. I was doing a little research and read a story of a man by the name of William Harvey Carney. He was the first African-American awarded the Medal of Honor. He was born a slave in Virginia, but eventually made his way to freedom in Massachusetts. When the Union Army began accepting volunteers, he joined the 54th Infantry Regiment, the first African-American unit organized by the northern states, though it was led by white officers. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, led by Robert Shaw, was tasked with taking Fort Wagner, a beachhead fortification that guarded the southern approach to Charleston Harbor. A previous attack on the fort failed, and the 54th was chosen for the next attempt. As the soldiers stormed the fort walls, the Union flag bearer was killed. Kearney grabbed the flag and held it for the duration of the battle. Carney, along with the rest of the 54th, was forced to retreat. Throughout the battle, Carney never lost possession of the flag, despite suffering multiple injuries. Boys, I only did my duty. The flag never touched the ground, he said after the battle. Carney was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1900. Whether he received his marching orders from a sergeant or from a place that's unseen by human eye, William Carney received his marching orders. I believe that marching orders are the greatest, of the greatest importance in the most obscure times. You know, it's the reason that they train so much in the military is that when all of heck is breaking loose, it is a muscle memory. It is a natural course of life to do what they do. 
And I'm afraid that our, our lives, mine included, I'm afraid that we have gotten so accustomed to marching to the beat of a different drum that we really don't even know how to act as Christians when things are stripped away from us. We don't even know how to act as people when things that we have built as our kingdoms are stripped away from us. And I believe that Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe Paul actually gives us a glimpse into those marching orders. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, this is what the Bible says. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul here, I believe, gives us at least three of those insights into our marching orders. And the first one is simply this, is why we march. Why do we march? Why do we live this Christian life? Why is it that we go against the stream of the normal course of life? And, and, and you know, it's amazing when I say that, I think that we have an opportunity today to march in that direction in a greater way than we ever have. Our eyes have been opened. Our ears are attentive to things that we have not been attent had our attention turned to before in our lifetimes. I mean, our world is actually being put on pause. I mean, you go around and you look, and it's amazing. We, we are just talking with people this week that, that how businesses are scaling down, how traffic is so light now that you can commute so quickly. And even hearing on the radio someone saying a testimony of the fact that they had heard something that was so obscure to them, and what it was was children playing in the streets and in the yards. Families sitting around dinner tables again, cooking at home a little more than we have in a long time. Those that know how to cook. <laughs> but while we march, Paul was uniquely seasoned, I believe, to look at things vertically before he would ever look at things horizontally. In other words, Paul was a seasoned veteran in the, in the war. And Paul would look at things in a vertical perspective. In other words, he would take things in light of the cross of Jesus Christ before he would ever relate those things to his natural life. If Christ spoke, Paul moved. And so in our lives, we have to realize why we actually march. He says that he marches because he's a prisoner. Listen to verse 1. He said, I'm therefore a prisoner of the Lord. It means that he was bound, and not just bound to anyone. The word Lord there, it literally, when you scale it all down and strip it bare, there's no other word that really sums it up in our language better than master. He was literally bound to his master, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, I'm therefore a prisoner of the Lord. Uh, he encourages us now as a prisoner of the Lord that we should be found worthy of the calling, that we should be at our best while we're on the mission. And so, I mean, when you think about it, why do we march? Is it because you and I also, he's speaking to other believers, fellow believers, you and I also are bound to this master. And we're not just bound to the master, we're bound to the mission. The mission, and we're bound to the measure, the, 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 the calling of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you or encourage you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That is the measure in which we are to take our lives to. In the Old Testament, it's called a plumb bob. That, 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 if, that is the true line that we are to measure everything by. And that's why Paul would, would bring everything that he had in his life, every challenge, every thought, to the cross. That everything would be in light of the cross of Jesus Christ. He says that you are to be your best while you're on the mission. That you're to be bound to this master that we have. We know that master to be Jesus Christ. Our daily walk, our daily living, that it lines up. Listen, this is, this is something important to get a hold of. 
that it lines up with the position that we have as a child of God. When he, he says there, uh, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, that worthiness, that word worthy there, the best picture we can give you is the picture of, of a set of scales. And that in our lives, we are on one side as we live our lives, and then there is the calling with which we were called, the, the, the price that was paid on Calvary's cross, the redemption of mankind, the, the reconciliation that, that was made there for the war that, was, that God had against man and the peace that was brought. And it's on one side and we're, we're on the other side in our lives. And as we go through our lives, we are to keep that balance that, that we are representatives of the King of kings and of the Lord of lords. We are the representative. We're His hands and His feet. So our marching orders can be started by understanding why we march. I just want to take a side note and say this. Isn't it a good thing to follow him? I mean, you can't tell me enough about my master. You can't tell me too many times of how he turned water into wine. You can't tell me too many times of how he healed a sick person. You can't tell me too many times, even after 20 years of serving him, you can't tell me too many times of how he touched the leper. And you can't tell me enough of how he caused the blind to see, spoke to the winds and told them to go back into their chambers, told the sea to lay down like a baby, slick as glass. You can't tell me too many times about the king that I serve. And I'll just say this, the king you follow will dictate how you march. So that brings us to our second thought. Not only is it teaching us why we march, but also how we march. Verse 2, verse 1 again, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Then he says in verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. The first thing that Paul admonishes us to do is to walk in humility or to march in this war with humility. It is a total contrary um, it, it, thought process. It is contrary to our natural uh, way of thinking. As a matter of fact, John Wesley observed that neither the Romans nor the Greeks had a word for humility. They saw anyone that did not think of themselves with pride and self-satisfaction as a coward. As if humility was a sign of weakness. But yet Paul here encourages us that we are to walk in humility. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says to humble yourselves because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself up under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. So God promotes the humble. And so in this war that we wage, we have been stripped of our own personal private powers. And God says, I want to empower you. And the way I'll empower you is if you first find yourself to be humble. This seems to be the foundation of the Christian walk is humility, because nothing else can be added to the top of it until you actually have humility. And I, I'm going to tell you, that is a lifelong struggle. It is a lifelong struggle. Humility is at the very heart and foundation of Christian character and life. So without humility, you have nothing to build upon. But if you lay that foundation of humility, Paul says, then upon humility... You need to add meekness or gentleness. This is one that I struggle with probably the most. You would think that humility would be the one that you struggle with the most, and I would say that it is a great challenge. But for me, and I believe for a lot of folks, the moment that we begin to be humble, we begin to be proud again in that humility. And so it's that constant battle. I find it that it's on that side of the humility that I began to have my greatest battle as an individual, as one to be submissive up under his lordship or to be walking according to the 
orders in which he has given me. That word meekness, it's not timid weakness. It's, it, it means it has nothing, it means that it's power under control. It's the picture of an animal being tamed. As a matter of fact, it's used often of horses. How the horse would be broke, broken and the, the, the master would control the horse. And you know, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? isn't it? You can take a horse and break him, but he doesn't lose his strength. As a matter of fact, they, they plow the straightest rows when they're under the control of the reins, don't they? Still have all the power that they had before, but now it's just power up under control. And that's what God wants for us, is that we would be up under his full control, humility. And then upon humility builds weakness. And then upon weakness, we have patience. If we ever get to that point, to where we have experienced meekness, at that point, there is this thing called peace, I believe, that comes along with the patience. I believe the patience produces the peace that comes in us. It, it's the patience to endure negative circumstances and never give in to them. The peace to endure negative circumstances and never give in to them literally means long-tempered. Man, isn't that something that God's trying to teach us right now? Uh, my, one of, well, my youngest daughter stood hovering over me Friday evening. And I was like, what do you want? She said, what do we do? <laughs> That's exactly what I laughed. I was like, <laughs> you can go through a drive through I reckon. But you can't stay there long. Isn't it amazing? Our lives are so enveloped that now even, I don't have mine on me, but even the device is becoming boring. It's amazing, isn't it? And I'm having to learn in my own life all of these marching orders again but seeing them in a different light than I've ever seen them before. Patience. When H.M. Stanley went to Africa in 1871 to report on David Livingstone's missionary journey, Livingstone never spoke to him about spiritual matters. But Stanley watched him lovingly and patiently with compassion minister to the people there of Africa. He couldn't understand it, but Stanley said this, when I saw the unwearied patience, that unflagging zeal, and these enlightened sons of Africa, I became a Christian at his side, though he never spoke to me a word. I believe he saw someone marching to the orders of the Christian life, to humility, meekness, and patience. And then lastly, and I think this to be probably the most important in the day and time in which we live, is the fact that within our marching orders, we need to remember with whom we march. We need to remember with whom we march. See, we're not an island under ourselves. As Christians, we don't walk to the beat of our own drum. We walk to the beat of his drum, but we don't walk alone. Watch, watch the words here, verse 2 again. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Bearing with one another, other believers, other believers who need to be covered with love. That is the bearing with one another in love. And that word for love is the same word that Christ shared for us in the cross of Calvary. That we are to bear with one another in love. When we look at that text and look at that word there, bearing, 
the bearing with one another. It is literally the picture of taking a blanket and covering someone so that others can't see the trauma that they're in. First Peter teaches us that love covers a multitude of sin. There are a lot of things in the Christian life that we could shield our brothers and sisters from. I, I, it's been amazing to me. I, I know, as a matter of fact, I've been trying to keep myself away from the negative press. But it is amazing to me in the Christian life just how many people I have talked to that are as pastors and church leaders that are defending others within the mix of what's going on. I even said from this very platform myself last week, if somebody meets or somebody doesn't meet, it doesn't make one more spiritual than the other. But it's amazing to watch, and I'm just going to go ahead and get it out there. It's just amazing to watch some people say, well, if, you'd, if you had faith, you'd meet. That is the very attitude in which the church gets destroyed. You have a responsibility before God to walk your walk. I have a responsibility before God to walk my walk. There's nothing that would thrill me more than to see a couple of services full of people sitting in the building. But that doesn't define who the church is. And it doesn't define who my Lord and Savior is, my Master. We, we fight in a different battle today than we did two weeks ago. The marching orders are still the same, although the battlefield has changed. Nothing about the Christian life changes other than the fact that we may see a little more clearly exactly why we are commissioned to fight this battle. Because there are people out there wandering around and they're walking through stores with this look upon their face of like, what do I do? I know y'all have all heard this silly joke going around about the rapture. If you hadn't, I'll share it with you. That the reason that there's no toilet paper is because the roll's been called up yonder. So it's, but people are walking around. I walk in the stores and I look at their faces and it literally breaks my heart. I'm not worried about what's going on in the store, on the shelves. I look at the people and I go, they have no idea. They have no hope whatsoever. There are people that are panicking because if they don't grab enough resources and huddle up in their holy huddle at home or somewhere that they'll not survive. And for the Christian, the one that truly knows Christ, I'm not saying that we live recklessly, but I'm saying that we make it through life with a different perspective because if I stay, I'm good. If I leave here, I'm still good. As a matter of fact, I'm better. As Paul said, for me to die is gain for me, but for me to stay is gain for you. So if I stay here a little bit longer, that gives me an opportunity to fight in a few more battles. But if I leave here, then what we all have been searching for becomes, becomes sight. Other believers need to be covered with love. In other words, when you see a brother or sister that is, ha, has sin in their lives, if there is not someone immediately that needs to be involved in it so that reconciliation can happen, or maybe you need to give a little time and work on that so that reconciliation can happen, then nobody else really needs to know about that. And it is our job as, our brother, as brothers and sisters to come along beside them and throw the blanket over them and take them to the only place that they can get help, and that's the cross. We march with others, other believers, not only who need to be covered with love, but who need to be united through the Spirit and not through buildings. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, that's what he says there. He says, bearing with one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul's not talking about organizational unity like is promoted in denominational and ecumenical work. He's speaking of the inner and universal unity of the Spirit by which every true believer is bound 
to every other believer. I just called a dear brother of mine. As a matter of fact, I, I, I messaged several pastors yesterday. But I just called a dear brother of mine that when people look at us together, we would be seen serving two different masters. Denominational stuff. That's not what unites us. As a matter of fact, it was the whisper of God through the Holy Spirit to my heart that said, call him and tell him you love him. See, I didn't get a letter from a denominational hierarchy. I didn't get an encouragement from a local administrative body over some denomination. The Pope didn't ask me to call him. Before the signs were ever in front of buildings, the Holy Spirit of God was building a church. This unity does not come from the outside, but it comes from the inside. The church is not the organizer of the unity, but it's the unity that is the organizer of the church. That's what the body of believers is. It's not a, we always say it's not a building, it's, it's people. Other believers. And lastly, other believers who need to be bound together in peace. That's what it literally means there, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's almost like a belt that would bind us together, that we would be, we would be pulled together in the bond of peace, the belt that surrounds and binds God's people together. One mind, one accord. That's what united the first church in the book of Acts. One mind, one accord. Meeting together, house to house, breaking bread, studying the apostles' doctrine, praying together, seeking the Lord's direction, having communion. It is that one mind and one accord that God has always wanted for His people. He would say that, I pray that they would be one just as we are one. And there is peace in that. There, there's a peace, as a matter of fact, that passes all understanding. I'm, I'm afraid that it's gone so far beyond just tags on churches. We actually live in our country as a people who at one time we would look at situations in people's lives and we would say, are they right or are they wrong? Did they, do, did they break the law or did they not break the law? And we would judge these things and say, you're, you're guilty or you're not guilty. You're right or you're wrong. But now things have shifted. I heard Ravi Zacharias say this. Now things seem to have shifted to where all the talk now, it's not about whether people are right or wrong. Are you on the left or are you on the right? Are you a leftist or are you on the right? Are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Right or left? And we've forgotten there's an up and a down. We've forgotten that our lives are to be consistent with Paul, what Paul was trying to teach us is that everything is to be brought into the light of the cross first before it ever makes it into our daily lives. And that's something we desperately need today. One of the greatest needs, I believe, in that is the decision of whether or not you're saved. You know, you, you have to, I believe, come to a conclusion within your own hearts and your own minds are you a believer? If, you're, if you've thought that you were a believer, but you don't really know for sure, here's a simple way to get to the heart of it. Are you, are your, is your debt paid? And do you live life differently now that your debt has been paid and you have secured that? See, everybody on the face of this planet is guilty. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. That means if you stole something throughout your life, you 
stole a pencil off your third grade teacher's desk or whatever you have ever done. Anything you've ever taken that does not belong to you, no matter how little or insignificant you may think that it is. You took a cookie off a of grandma's counter. Well, guess what? You're a thief. And thieves will stand guilty before God if their sins are not atoned for. And we could go through the whole list. Have you uh, took the Lord's name in vain? Have you um, back talk your mom and daddy? I mean, we could sit here and walk through the list of ten. He says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of them all. If you're found guilty, you'll stand before a judge. I believe the Bible teaches us and that creation itself screams that God is that judge. And you'll stand guilty before that judge one day. And there's only one thing that will acquit you. That is the atonement that was paid on Calvary's cross. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. But he died for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ gave his life and died for us. For the unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous. And all he is requiring of us is that if you hear the Holy Spirit of God whispering in your heart, you really need to get this straight. He says, you need to admit right now that you're a sinner. You need to confess it right now to yourself and before God. God, I'm a sinner. Just as the prodigal son came to himself in the pig pen and said, I've sinned against heaven and against my father, no longer worthy to be called his son. You admit that you're a sinner. Then you believe by faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. If he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, then everything that you have ever done or will ever do, he paid for on that cross. He took the punishment that you deserved. He stood in your place. And then you confess him as Lord. That he rose from the tomb on the third day, and now, since he has the only keys to death, hell, and the grave, he has the only answer, you confess him as the Lord of your life. So you admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, that he rose again on the third day, and that you confess him now as your Lord, and that you're going to live for him, for him from this point forward. The Bible says that the old things will be passed away and the new things will come, that all will be made new. And it's not that God changes what you do, it's that God changes what you want to do. God didn't come... <laughs> To make bad people good. God came to make dead people live. That's why he came. And so if that's you right now, you can pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior by praying and saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. And I realize it today. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose on the third day. And we're going to be celebrating that very soon, Easter. And I'm going to tell you right now, hell itself ain't going to stop that celebration. The coronavirus can do whatever it wants to, but that will be a celebration day regardless of anything that's going on in this world. We will celebrate Easter. And that you confess Him as Lord of your life. And you'll be saved. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you spoke those things to Christ in your heart today, we want to encourage you. You can um, find us in multiple ways. You can go on our uh, Facebook page and find us, Chestnut Ridge Baptist Church. You can also go to the website, Google Chestnut Ridge. you find us there. Um, there, are con there are all kind of uh, links and all kind of information that's out of my wheelhouse. I just know all of it's there. Somebody's got that prepared just for you to be able to contact us and let us know that you have uh, accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want to serve Him, we don't necessarily need you to come to Chestnut Ridge to do that for the rest of your life. But we do want to encourage you to get into a church and follow through in believer's baptism and get into a church that will teach and, and uh, train you up and send you out into the mission field. Um, so we want to encourage you in that. And for our home folks, I just want to simply say this. We miss you. We love you. And we want to encourage you in these times 
Uh, we want you, we encourage you to continue to follow along with us. We will get information out to you as best we possibly can. Keep up with you. Call us if you need us. And also, we want to, I want you to remain faithful in your giving. There are multiple ways you can do that. You can find links on our uh, website, Facebook page. You can link the website from the Facebook page. Um, you can call into the church office. You can mail, mail in. You, can, uh, you, you know how to do it. Just be faithful to do it. So uh, we just encourage you in that. Till the next time that we air a video, we just want you to know that we love you and we appreciate you. God bless you. Bye-bye.